I have never acted as a coward or in fear. In fact, I'm standing in front of you. As most of you know, I have a mystery illness I've had for the better part of at least 12 years. My mystery illness is I can get episodes of nausea and vomiting that start with a simple headache. I've been to every doctor and every specialist. No one knows what it is. It comes upon me suddenly. And when it does, it usually takes me out for a solid 12 hours. And typically, it either happens on a Friday or a Saturday, which was the case Friday and all of Saturday. And I'm standing here in front of you just a little, a little weak over what's happened to me, but still not 100%. I don't have the flu, and I don't have COVID-19. I just happen to have something that reoccurs. So I'm telling you in advance, if I look a little peaked or not my usual self, that's what's going on. I always like to tell you everything up front. Um, in fact, I'm just going to reorganize the service today because I know there's a lot of people that will be tuned in. And um, I've heard that various church services have been canceled that in many different places, all of the services that we need to function and things that people think are normal or logical, um, decisions that are being made, which I'm not sure that they are. Now, I preach faith, not foolishness, and I don't want anybody in the sound of my voice to think that, uh, go out and take a risk and be stupid. But I did print this out for my audience to see, and although I am not a medical uh, person. I have access to the same tools as you do. My PhD comes, obviously, you get a PhD from doing research, so I like to dip into things, but I'm never going to tell you I am a medical expert. I'd like you to look at something that I, I printed out for you so you can see it visibly. This is from the CDC, from the CDC's website. You can go there at your leisure. This is the top range from the 2017-2018 flu season. And here's your pyramid, 12 to 61,000 deaths, 140 to 810,000 hospitalizations. And can you see that first number right there? That looks like 9,300,000, right? Is that the number you're seeing? To 45 million, somewhere in that range. So thus far, and I'm, I'm doing this for a reason. I'm, I don't know what this is. I don't know, you know. I'm sure a lot of you came today thinking, you don't even know what this is. Is this panic driven by the media? Is it real? Yes, it's real, but we don't know what it is. But I can tell you this. I showed you this. No one seems to be panicking over this. And there have been, uh, I believe, less than 50 deaths so far from this virus that's going around. There are over 100 uh, 1,016 uh, cases identified, but less than 50 deaths, which leaves me in a quandary, like probably many of you, to try and figure out why people have raided grocery stores and other places for supplies. I understand, but this, this regular flu, can, can, is, am I speaking English to anybody out there? This regular flu will attack America every single year. We've had Ebola, we've had SARS. Now, I'm just gonna say this as plain as day. I am not a coward, and I believe that God hates cowards. He also hates people who succumb to fear. Why? Because I'm gonna read you every scripture that I feel is important. Maybe it won't be important for you because you came full of faith, but it might be important for you to share with your friends and family, even if they are not full-blown believers, but there is something desperately wrong. I'm not, I don't preach stoicism, but there's something desperately wrong when our country is running fearfully from the unknown. And yes, is it a global situation? It is. And is this disease spreading rapidly? Yes, it is. And I'm sure if you drove here, you saw the signs on the freeway that say, they're Caltrans, of course, Caltrans signs. You all know what I think about Caltrans. <laughs> Avoid gatherings. Now, let me ask you this question, and I'm, I'm, I'm not going to tell you that I'm for or against anything right now because I'm not a doctor. I'm not a medical doctor. I don't have enough information. I'm a pastor, and I'm a teacher, and I'm a person of faith, and I do not believe that fear or panic ever cured or solved anything. So friends listening to me out there, you are in the sanctuary. You're here full of faith and not confused, 
But you who are out there, and potentially, I pray God, people who are just randomly tuning in this morning because they don't know what the hell to do. I'm telling you something. Panic is not the solution. Neither is fear and neither is cowardice. There has never been a global problem solved by people gripped by fear in the terror of something they know not. And I'll tell you what else we're, we're seeing. We're seeing a great lack of faith, which is what I've been saying. Our, our friendly entertainment churches who preach no gospel, this has created more pande pandemonium among Christian believers who are not really believers because they don't have any Bible. And shame on you pastors out there who have not stuck to the word of God, who could have at least infused people who, who have clung to the name of Jesus but have absolutely nothing else. They might say Jesus, but they don't know what faith is and how to grab hold of it. And I'm not telling you that I'm on some mountaintop. Don't think that. But I am appalled. I have no sympathy, rather. I'll say that. For people running like crazy mad people because they have not figured out, neither have I, and I'm sure the vast majority of you have not figured out what this is. Now, maybe God is going to use fear that's in people's hearts to make them turn back to God. I'm telling you something. This country has sunk so far away from its Christian moorings, and I don't care, what, you know, people that want to tell you, no, it hasn't, we're still great. Well, if it, if it was still great, we wouldn't have an ex-con on TV selling uh, emergency food to people and telling them to take a specific vitamin because that's a cure, or another one who says he's healing people through the TV of this disease when we don't even know what it is. I'm sorry. That's the lunacy of Christianity that makes me embarrassed to be associated with any of those people. But for the people who understand, people of faith, we don't react the same way. We are not reactionary in that capacity. Our, our place is to turn to God, and I'm not going to be like the people that are ignorant, and they will only turn to God, and they won't keep their powder dry. But this is the time where America needs to turn to God, for in God's word we find at least something to grab hold of that tells us over and over and over and over and over again God is not the author of fear or confusion. And anybody who can hear today, I don't care if you're not a Christian listening to me. I don't care who you are listening to me. I want you to know something. There is a greater power in the universe that is not the government, that is not any government power. There is a power greater on earth, not just in the heavens above, that is able to respond to the pleas of people crying out for help. And I'm sorry to say this. You may not like what I'm going to say, but I'm just going to say it. We should be a nation showing an example to the world. Yes, we have great tools, and we've got all kinds of wonderful technology. But foremost, what made this country great at its inception, people of faith trusting in, I, go, I always go back to this, people coming to an unknown land, coming by faith, to have religious freedom to worship freely as they so choose. We have forgotten the luxury and the freedom because we treat all of that so casually, like no one ever fought for that. And just so we can all be clear in our minds, every, I'm going to say, apart from this information we get from the CDC about the flu, every generation up until a certain time had its woes. And when I talk about woes, forgive me, because putting the black plague as a woe is not necessarily, the, the two don't necessarily mesh together. But if you read history, hundreds of thousands, no, in fact, millions of people wiped off the map through successive plagues and other diseases that we had no cure for. Now, I'm just saying this, and I'm putting this out there, and then I'm going to start into my message I am, if I do anything next week, if anything changes and we don't have a regular service, it is not for fear of any reason. It is more for the protection of people in this building 
I don't have good sense right now to say whether or not gathering is bad. Quite frankly, we, if you think about it, this disease has been circulating. Um, the report that I heard was they first discovered the jump. They can actually pinpoint if this information is correct. They can pinpoint the jump from a pangolin, which is an endangered species, to a human sometime in late November of last year. That means this disease has been circulating for far longer than the panic and the pandemonium that's been created. Like, let's get a reality check. Certain things that I'm, I'm not going to tell you when I look, there's a map that the CDC provides, which shows you clearly the darkest parts of the map are where the most cases have occurred. You can see our state is right there. So that's why I said to you, I'm in the wait and see mode, but I'm not in the fear mode and I'm not in the panic mode. I had people telling me uh, pretty much through the week, maybe you want to reconsider, maybe you want to this. Well, when I heard that the Pope, who speaks from a window high above the square, removed himself and said it was unsafe. He's, he's, I don't know, four or 500 feet away from people that are on the ground. <laughs> now, listen, I, I'm going to say this. He is elderly, so maybe that, in, that could possibly make sense. But when you're that far removed, even the CDC says, uh, if you're going to distance yourself, which, by the way, I think that's bad information. And I'm, it's, it, that's just an opinion on my part. Because if this is an airborne situation, I, I really don't think that distancing yourself several meters, as they put it in their um, website, I don't, if it's airborne, it's going to spread. And the other thing I'd like to just say, and it's a personal note, is I'm kind of confused about the run on toilet paper. <laughs> Now, if you're, I realize that I have people here that are here for the first time and some returning guests, so I don't want you to think this is the normal that I would normally do, but I felt compelled today to talk not just to the congregation, not just to our internet and radio audience, but people who generally, I'm pretty convinced, are trying to find some handle somewhere to grab hold of, and I'm going to try and give you that, but I'm telling you something. And when I'm done, hopefully you'll see what I'm saying. Maybe for someone who doesn't know God's word or who doesn't care about the things of God, what I'm saying is foolishness. But I'm going to tell you, um, I think we have seen enough examples of God coming through. I'm not one of these people that preaches, as I said, I don't, I don't tell people to do foolish things. I always am preaching and teaching faith, and I'm telling you, exactly how I feel today. I did not come here with a spirit of fear. I do not know what exactly, as I just said, what we're dealing with, but I do know this. I do know that a lot of people are going to be hurt by massive closures of business and industry. Probably more so, I'm sorry to say this, and it's my opinion, but I think the massive closure of, of amusement parks, which just that in and of itself, I don't know the number, but the number of people employed there has to be off the charts. Can you imagine what happens when you send, um, I, I don't know what the number is, but it has to be something very, when you send those people home and they don't have, they don't have a paycheck. And when we talk about, we'll call them the non-essentials, but actually they are essentials. The non-essentials that I, I label non-essential, NBA, NFL, probably in my life I could live without those forever. But there are people, and I'm not talking about the overpaid athletes. I'm talking about the people who work, the stands, the people who are selling goods and services. Those people are going to be hurt, just like people that are employees, teachers, principals, anybody who is servicing a school district. It's going to be hard hurt when it comes down to a month or possibly two months or even three months without a paycheck where people still need to feed their families. Now, I know that the argument on the other side is, well, if that's the case, but what happens if people get sick and people die and then there's no family to feed? We're not even there yet. And when I say we're not even there yet, I don't mean to treat this casually, but I'm saying I showed you the numbers of regular flu. 
And I don't hear anyone talking about regular flu, which is usually the nemesis for this time of year. So all I'm telling you is, please, after listening to me today, and I'm going to start talking and teaching right now, I'm asking you to take in everything I say. And although it may be, for some of my listening audience, it may be very disturbing because, you know, the herd mentality is go with the herd. Well, I'm not going to put anyone here at danger, but I think you know me well enough by now to know I don't have the herd mentality. I don't go with the flow, and I'm not interested in the one thing that is really actually driving me crazy, is people are being overstimulated with fear and panic by the media. Every station you turn on and every outlet that you can see or hear is placing fear and panic in people's hearts. Now, do your part, but I'd say this be, just like what the Bible says, be strong, act in faith, and let's just see what happens. But right now, I want to share some things with you that I thought were quite appropriate for what we're going in and through at this particular time. So I am not bringing you back into the series today. I'm choosing to do something a little bit different. If you'd like to follow through in the Bible with me, because I'm going to be going through lots of books, and I'm asking those people out there, if you are not a Bible person, you're not a church-going person, and I'm doing this deliberately for a lot of the, we'll call them not quite church people, I want you to get a pen and paper, and I want you to write down these verses of Scripture. Even if you don't have a Bible, you can always look them up on the Internet when I'm done. But I want you to write these down as I go through them, because these are the things we hang on to. Christianity is not a bunch of rules like some people think. Christianity is faith rooted and defined in a person, Jesus Christ, who supposedly, by the way, lives in me once I have opened my heart to hearing faith. Christ lives in my heart. So if Christ lives in my heart, how does fear and anxiety do living next door to Jesus inside of me? And I'm saying that very sarc sarcastically because this week alone I encountered enough quote-unquote Christians who were so gripped with fear, I thought to myself, this is why I, I have been going at this about churches not teaching and preaching the gospel message and the fruits of that lack are coming to roost. So I'm going to go through some scriptures here, and I'm going to talk about each one. Deuteronomy 31 and verse 6. Deuteronomy 31 and verse 6 says, Be strong and of good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. And the them in this case are the giants living in the promised land prior to God delivering them, his people, into the land. Now you could replace the them with anything that you think is bigger and more problematic than you've ever dealt with. Today I'm going to just give you a whole bunch of promises now, this is Mo from Moses' writing, but Moses was inspired by God. This isn't Moses as a brilliant man and a, a great thinker and a theologian. This is God's spirit flowing through all of these different individuals who will essentially say the same thing over and over again. For the Lord thy God, he it is that, do that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee nor forsake thee. And I chose to go down this pathway, as I said, because it's necessary for some of us to be reinforced in what we believe and what we hold fast to. Of course, I don't, I'm not going to even uh, camp out on any one verse of Scripture. I'm just wanting you to compile these, and I want these to be what you use through the week. And if you have been um, surrounded by people who are full of fear, the only way to get rid of fear is you go back into the Word. And I, I'm, I need to reiterate this. I do not preach Stoicism. But I also have no patience for people that in the face of, and this is a crisis, a crisis we don't know what, but it is a crisis. 
There's nothing worse than people panicking in the face of crisis. In fact, I'm reminded somebody was saying this very, very same thing to me earlier in the week about, you realize that the vast majority of the people on the Titanic could have been saved. It was panic and fear that basically killed the remnant of the people who couldn't get on those lifeboats. That's what panic and fear does. Let's get that straight. Now, we can say, well, God gave those words to Moses to say to the people, but I'm sure Moses could also take them to his heart. To Moses' uh, successor, Joshua, he spoke the same words in a different way, which I think I've touched on these verses many, many times, but in Joshua, where Joshua is told from the word of God, from God himself, have I not commanded thee? Be strong and of good courage, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. That's the word to Joshua, but still a word to us. Wherever you go, I'm, now I'm not saying be foolish and put yourself in danger, but do not let yourself succumb to this trend that's happening. And all I can do is, is go through the word with you and show you that over and over and over again, from different people at different times, God has been saying the same thing to the most beloved psalm of the church, Psalm 23 and verse 4. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Now, I know to the people who are listening to me, who are regular listeners, all great for you, you know all these scriptures. I'm more concerned, because you all showed up here today, I'm more concerned about the people who don't have the faith and the understanding. So this is going to become a template. I'm going to read off these scriptures, and then we're going to mix it up like a good slumgullion and put it all together. Psalm 23 and verse 4 says, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. And I want to underline two things in there. Fearing no evil and that God is with me, and God is with you. Again, over and over and over again, this same thing is repeated. If you just turn the page, one, one page forward to Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? You know, it'll be wonderful when we can look at this all of these parts of the Bible and say, and these people didn't even have the book we have. Do you know what I'm saying? We have a book we can open up. They didn't even have a book. If they have the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, they didn't have the rest of it. So we have the luxury of reaching in here, and that's exactly what we're doing today. I'm taking this one verse out of Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Of whom shall I fear? You can see this is all repetition. The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Or of what shall I be afraid? So I like to say that, of whom or of what. And the only fear that has value before God is what Psalm 111.10 says, fear of the Lord. And I think it's also in the Proverbs as well. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And that's a different type of fear, by the way. That's awe, reverence, respect. That's the only type of fear, if we're going to use that word, that brings any good into one's life. All right, going to the next place, which is Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Now, I think we are in trouble. I think we are in trouble, but it's something, again, we know not what. Let me ask here, and I want you to raise your hands, in the last, in the last 10 years, because I know I've got a couple of people here with, have, who have had brushes with death, a um, couple of people here who are actually just recovering from major, major surgery, but how many people here, let's go with the last five years, have had something, take them down for an, a week, two weeks, even a month, where you, you're not able to do anything, you've just been that sick. Has that happened here? That's enough of you. And the thing that happens there is that can happen anywhere. But if we start thinking about this is going to happen to me and it's coming my way, 
Well, the Bible also says what you think comes to pass, you know, what, what you actually are speaking about and speaking in, in a reverse faith, if, if that's what you're willing for, I'm, that may just happen to you. Uh, there is a, a passage out of Proverbs that says, an anxious heart weighs a man down, but a good word, and I'm going to say a good word from this book, can lift a man up. I'm not sure why it is, but the more even I read, I'm thinking to myself, well, if God's not the author of fear and confusion, why is all, everything around me so out of whack? Well, I think we'll be talking about this, this particular time. If we live to see the day, which I'm, I'm not sure we will, but if we live to see the day when Antichrist comes on the scene, can you see what's happened with something we know not, something that will deceive the people into something that's good and for them, and it, the Bible says even the very elect will be deceived. And this is why I'm telling you, this is actually a test run, I believe, for future things to come. And we're not really, I'm going to say this, and you know, somebody might say, wow, that's pretty insulting. You know that I'm a proud American, I love this country, I don't necessarily like the politics of this country, but I love this country, I love the flag, I love what this country represents. You might think this is an un-American thing to say. We saw a little turnaround after 9-11 of people actually turning back to God because everything was shaken so badly, but it had no staying power. Maybe we need a lesson of how unmoored we've become because the rest of the world may be panicking and feeling like it's spinning out of control. We've always been... America's always been the solid ground. Think back to our history and every war where we have, we've been there for other people. We've been the muscle. We've been the strength. We've been the place that people turn to for help, guidance, and stability. Now, the whole world is looking on, and by the way, probably half of the world doesn't understand that the president can't do anything he can make declarations and he can do whatever he can do, but it's quite limited in controlling a disease that could be spread among, amongst individuals. Unless you live in a place where you enforce martial law, you're not going to have complete control because our president or any president that has been a president of these United States is not a dictator. So the burden is on the people. The burden's on the people to be responsible and to act a little bit more in faith than in fear. So you can see why I'm just doing this, and hopefully the broader listening audience is hearing what I'm saying. Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And I would say a very present help in trouble when not in trouble, but certainly in times of crisis, certainly in times of uncertainty. You lean on God. And I'm going to ask the question, Mostly to the listening audience, not so much in here. Who have you been talking to and who have you been leaning on the last 24 hours, the last week or the last month throughout all of this? And if you've been calling friends and family but haven't said a prayer or asked God for help, I'd say there's the beginning, just the beginning of bringing peace to your innermost being. Why? Because my Bible says that Understanding, latching on, clinging to God brings something that is peace that passes all understanding. I'm in the middle of a storm. I don't know why, but I have peace. That's what comes from God when I ask for it. That gives me the ability to think clearly and make sound and rational decisions when I must make them. This is what's missing. All right. My favorite one of these, Psalm 56. Psalm 56, what time I am afraid. Have you turned there yet? Psalm 56 and verse 3, although most of you know this verse by heart. What time I'm afraid. What does it say? I will trust in thee. I like that one the best. Now there's, there's a progression to this. You can be afraid, and you start to turn towards the Lord, and you start talking to the Lord, and you say, I'm afraid. But what time I'm afraid, 
I will turn to you and I will trust you. And ultimately, those words become, I will trust in the Lord, no matter what. There's a progression. A lot of people ask me why, in many instances in my life, why am I not fearful? Why am I not scared? That's not a normal reaction to certain things. Well, it is a normal reaction if you're walking with the Lord. And as I said, I don't preach foolishness. But if you're walking with the Lord and you're wanting to understand about God's mind and the heart of God, then you begin to understand that God is not, as I just said this three times already, he's not the author of fear and confusion. He brings order to everything. He brings stability. He brings clarity. So that's why I said, look around you, and this is how you know we are in a very godless state. And I'm not talking about California. <laughs> now, out of, out of the Psalter and into the book of Isaiah. And I told you, if you haven't written these down somewhere, most of you know these, but some of my listening audience doesn't. I'm asking you to write these down because they're verses of Scripture that have either filled your heart with faith and cast out the fear, but there are certainly Scriptures you would do well to be able to share with other people. And as I said, whether they're believers or not, a lot of times you can put things in your own words. There's scripture put into the way you would say it, the way it would come out of your mouth. Many times I'm sitting with people and they will actually say biblical things without knowing because they don't really know the Bible. I'll say, you know, you, you just quoted the Bible. And they'll, I did? <laughs> yeah. In your own words, you just quoted the Bible. You just, that happens a lot. People don't even know it. So this is a good tool, especially in these times. Out of Isaiah 35 and verse 4, Say to them that are of a fearful heart, Be strong, fear not, behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with recompense. He will come and save you. God is coming to the rescue. Now, I know you might, some, some people out there who don't have uh, a lot of faith will say, Well, I'm in trouble right now and God's not rescuing me. Well, don't think that your two-second faith mechanism that's just been turned on acts like a Pez dispenser for God. That doesn't mean you get put at the back of the line either. It just means be patient. There are a lot of things God can do. I don't preach the crazy stuff out there that people, a lot of people talk about and do or say that God does. I tell you what's coming from this book. And what's coming from this book is sound doctrine on how to navigate with the rest of the world doing what they're doing. I'm telling you something. God does come to our help. He does come to our aid. And I'm telling you firsthand knowledge because this morning when I woke up, and I see this every time, it should be an example to you already. How many times have you seen me come and I say I'm sick or I've been sick and I'm not 100%? And by the time I leave this platform, if I'm not 100%, I'm on my way to feeling much better. Now, you could say that's just, you just talked yourself into it. Well, sometimes that's what we have to do. I remember my late husband saying that. He had to talk himself into faith when he was facing his cancer, and he did that every single day. That's what we do. When you can't, when you can't just have it, you muster it. It comes from the Word. You cling to it. So for those people who don't have the faith and who are fearing, tell them. God's on your side. God's going to come and rescue you. The thing is, you've got to trust him. Remember what I just said out of the other psalm, what time I'm afraid? I will trust in the Lord. I'm not going to put my trust somewhere else. I'm going to trust in the Lord. Stay in Isaiah 40, or 41 rather, in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 41 and verse 10. I told you this would be a different type of message, but it's the only way I know to communicate to a vast audience if you're going to latch on to this book, God's word penned through diverse people over the course of hundreds and indeed thousands of years, and they're all saying the same thing. They're all saying, fear not. Fear not. Do not be afraid. The message I've preached here so many times, what's the Greek word for courage? Farsa. Say it louder. Farsa. That word, you know, when Jesus spoke to his disciples, and he said, fear not. What he was saying is courage. Courage is 90% of 
of faith and 10% of all that other stuff. And that's, I'm actually plagiarizing someone else who said that. If you've listened any time, you know who I'm quoting. But I found that to be true. And as I was just saying to you, how many times have I exercised faith that says, I'm just not feeling good, but I'm going to get up and I'm going to go. I have a responsibility to you and to God. You have a responsibility to yourselves, to God, and to the people immediately in your circle, your immediate family, your friends. This is, to me, this is the only way I know to help some of you in dealing with the circle around you. Because, you know, if you stick close enough to people who are in a panic, do you know what happens? You'll begin to panic. If you stick close to people who are full of fear and doubt, and you're around them all the time, you will find yourself in no time at all having their vocabulary of fear and doubt. I choose to surround myself most of the time with people who understand God can and God will. And maybe, as I said, this is an important message for all of us. Reading these verses over and over again reinforces something God has been saying to his people for thousands of years. Fear is not the way. Isaiah 41, verse 10, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. The right hand is the hand of power. I, I want to encourage you. I want to help you today. But I couldn't think of any message that I could put together in a formula, excuse the terminology, that would cut to the heart as quickly as what I'm doing. And as I said, mostly for my listeners outside of the sanctuary, but I'm thinking that we can all use a little faith booster today. Turn with me to the New Testament. In the writing of Paul, in the 8th chapter of Romans, beginning at verse 35, and again, all of these are beloved scriptures to me, so I, I can't just, I could have just picked one and made a sermon out of it, but I wanted to pick multiple because I want to repeat something that God has been repeating over and over and over. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. Who or what can have the power to separate us from the love of Christ? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Why do I read that to you? Why? Because if the Bible says, what can separate us? I want you to include in that fear, panic, doubt, disbelief, the reality of circumstances. How many messages have been preached here about your circumstances or your situation, whether you brought it on yourself or it happened upon you? Many probably hundreds of messages, and they all come to the same thing. Stop looking at yourself, stop feeling sorry for yourself, and look to God. Quit acting like you're the only person on the face of the planet that has problems. And even a person like me, do I have doubts? I don't doubt God. Do I have doubts in other things? Yes, I doubt people a lot. If I had any gem of wisdom to give to a young individual in this day and age, I'd say, don't doubt God, but doubt people. People will fail you. People will turn on you. People will do stupid, crazy, malicious, outrageous things. But when you can find somebody, man or woman, who's got at the heart and center of their life, I'm not speaking about people who are monks and living in monasteries, but people at the heart and center of their life, worship a living God and trust the name of Jesus Christ and lean on this book, those people may still fail you, but their foundation is a little bit closer to the mind and heart of God. And when I say, even when Paul wrote, and he said, all Asia's forsaken me, only Luke is with me, 
that tells you that even for a Christian, you can still be bamboozled by the people closest to you and be left alone. But even Paul in his darkest hour, being thrown in a dungeon and left there, all he can ask for is bring, bring the scrolls, bring my, co my, clo my coat or my cloak. That's what he wanted. I don't hear him saying, woe is me, this is the end, and uh, I don't have much to look forward to, and this was a very unfruitful ministry. In fact, his is probably the greatest, apart from Jesus Christ, his is the greatest ministry. More people read and quote from the Apostle Paul outside of the Gospels than any other writings of the Bible. So what I'm saying to you is we have to have this mind in, enable, in, to enable us to understand that each time a crisis hits our life, whether it's this particular one or any one, God can bring clarity and order. And when you have clarity and order, you're able to make critical decisions and have critical analysis without being confused, without being blurred out, without being turned by every... If you, if you start reading different articles on the Internet, as I was... I happened to... Somebody sent me a podcast this morning, and I listened to it briefly for just a few minutes. This fellow was an individual um, specialist. He has worked through several presidencies. He's worked, you know, in the world in the World Health Organization. He's worked everywhere, but he's uh, an expert in his field. And I have to tell you, I was listening, but I'm also listening kind of with a, eh, I don't know if I, I don't know what to believe, right? Because that's, I'm sure most of us, I don't know, are you listening to things like this and not sure what you should believe or not believe? Good. So at least you have it all swallowed the Kool-Aid, because I'm, I'm not, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not wanting to offend, but I think there's a lot of people out there that are, okay, yeah, all right, and they're, they're off and running. The sentence hasn't even been finished. Um, but this individual was, was making some very salient and valid points. Um, but the person who was interviewing him asked a question. He said, um, well, I've heard that there are some remedies that you can, you can do for yourself that will help you. One of them is, uh, the interviewer says, one of them that he was told is go and, go and sit in a sauna. And while a sauna may detox your body, it's not going to get rid of this disease. And this is what this fellow was telling him. The same individual is saying that he spoke in front of a bunch of really prominent Silicon Valley folks. And after he was done talking, he opened up for questions. And he thought that he was fielding questions from six-year-olds. Because no one had really taken the time. This is why I said to you, I don't mean to insult those people. I think we're all in that state. We don't have enough information. People are making judgments or decisions or not making any decisions at all. But for the most part, they're making decisions based on information. No one knows where it's coming from. And um, th this is why I felt compelled this morning to just come and talk to you about what God has to say on the subject of fear. I'm going to repeat it again. God is not the author of fear or confusion. That's the devil that brings that confusion and I've said this over and over and over again. It's important for us to not become the people who are reactionary to every single thing, but faithing people who can stop for a minute and say, the first thing that I'm, I'm going to, and I'm telling you, the first thing that I thought of when I'm seeing people panic in this is I started praying, just praying for people. Even I know that they're, the world is not filled with believers, but every individual on the face of the planet, whether you like it or not, was created by a creator. And that creator did create some for honor and dishonor, some for uh, all the things that I have been talking to you about in my series on heaven and hell. But the one thing I can tell you, they're all his creation. Therefore, I just started praying. And I started praying, some, some of it was kind of maybe crazy prayer. If somebody heard my prayers, they said, that's crazy. Praying for the world, praying for people in the world, praying for people to stop panicking, praying for our government to have knowledge. But that, I'm sorry, that would take, <laughs> that would take a miracle. And, and when, when I say government, I'm talking about both sides, okay? So, so we can all be offended all at once. <laughs> I like the fact that, you know, if there was one scene that I would give money, I'd pay to see um, the Democrats and the Republicans have like a 
a real, a real knockdown drag, like a food fight or something. I'd pay to see that. <laughs> that would be worthy of my attention. Everything else is, I, you, you can't, I'm going to say it in the camera, although I, I'm sure none of these people actually listen, but I wouldn't pay attention to you for any time with the silliness and the stupidity of not being concerned for Americans. Most of these people are only concerned for themselves and for their little cadre around them. But for the American people, sorry, you've all been passed a finger, and it's not the index. I, I, I am, I, if you can tell, I'm perturbed about this because we should have cohesiveness, especially now with this particular event. We should have cohesiveness, and we don't. So along the way in this message of faith, I'm also telling you there are a lot of things that I've been praying for, like a food fight. <laughs> Philippians 4, 7 says, And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And I, I really want us to reflect. This is why I'm telling you scripture, chapter and verse, wanting you to write them down. I want you to revisit them. Hearts and minds. Well, keep your hearts and minds. Now, if your heart and mind are kept by Christ, it doesn't make you um, immune to getting a disease or having some, something bad happen, tribulations, as I just read out of Paul's writing. But at least my mind, I can have peace. And as I said, that's what's needed in these times. And I'll keep going because there's more, and this may be some of the best, I think, for me anyway. Out of 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 1, 7. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, and that uh, word for fear there should be, it should read cowardice or timidity. God is not, and I'm going to read it just how I'm interpreting it. God hath not given us a spirit of cowardice, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Now, I just finished reading a whole bunch of scriptures to you. You might say, well, what type of a message is that? It's the message that says, if you take hold of these verses, some of you who have made notes, write them down, revisit them through the week, you'll be able, at least for the people who don't have a solid foundation of faith, you'll be able to start sorting out with sanity and with clarity what you need to do for you. I can't tell you what you need to do for you, except... Be full of faith. I can say this. Taking this, what I've done today, instead of delivering a regular message, lets me tell you my position. Now, if it is at all possible, and if I do not think that there is a risk for us here, we'll gather next week. Uh, I had somebody say to me just yesterday, well, you know, there's a risk. What if, what if people get sick? And what if, and what if? And life is filled with what ifs. What if I leave here or you leave here, and I'm, I'm going to say it, I'll say you because you don't know who I'm talking about. When I say you, it could be any of yous. You leave here and you get hit by a car and die. Anything can happen in life, and that's why I tell you, live in the moment with Christ. Live in the scriptures. That means you've, you've got something in your brain all the time to grab hold of. Remember that I keep going back to this. What Jesus says out of John 15 about living in him, I in, I in them and they in me, the word in them, that abiding principle which when things like this happen, it's not going to solve the world's problems, it's not going to solve the shortage on toilet paper, but it will give you the ability to make good decisions in the moment or better decisions in the moment instead of following the crowd that is so gripped with, they don't even know what they're gripped with. As I said, if I go back to what I was looking at, from the CDC. What is be being labeled a global pandemic, and it is if you search the map, I think the only, was the only place on the map that was not yet hit, I think was Alaska, right? And the Northern Territories above, you know, Canada. And that's a no brainer. <laughs> the population in one town is three, right? Okay, so that's a no brainer, but there were other places, for example, Iowa and I believe uh, Alabama, which have not had any reported cases or incidences at all. And I'm sure there'll be some people that'll say, let's go to Alabama. 
But that's not acting in faith either. Now, I'm going to go back to some points in my life of uncertainty, and I'm, I'm going to only speak about me, because I can only speak for me right now. I cannot speak for any of you. I can only speak for me. And I can look back at the many difficult crises I've had over my life. And, you know, you, some of you who know me, you know, you'll, you'll, immediately you'll think back to 2005 with Dr. Scott's passing. And although that was extremely difficult for me, I've had several moments in my life, over the course of my lifetime, many of those were before I came to the faith. And I have something to look at before I knew the Lord, before I had faith, versus how I react now. And I can tell you, I have seen loved ones, people in close... I'm not, I'm not talking about my late husband. I'm talking about other people very close to me suffer prolonged very terrible deaths from one in particular was brain cancer that was just drawn out very long. And, and this was before I knew the Lord. And maybe, you know, some people have a more optimistic spirit, but all I could do was think to myself, this is no way to die. And for me, on the other side, no way to live because I'm helpless. There's nothing that I can do. And maybe in, in a very uh, embryonic way, I was trying to be positive and be upbeat, but that's not going to bring peace inside of me. That's not going to bring something additional. And I, as I said, I juxtapose before and after. And I can only tell you as I look at some of the very terrible things I went through early on in my life without faith versus the things I've navigated in my life to this point with faith, a life without faith is unimaginable to me. A life of fear is also unimaginable to me. That's why I've been teaching about heaven and hell, because I feel that even that area, people are still gripped with fear. Christian people are still gripped with fear when you talk to them about death and dying, because they haven't settled it, that Jesus said, it's like they're not listening. Jesus said, if you trust me, you're going to be with me, and you're going to live with me forever. You're going to live. You're going to be alive. You're not going to die. You're going to die here. You're going to be alive with me. Well, if Christians were listening to this, they wouldn't be so down and dismal. It means that every person who's trusted in Christ will be with him, alive with him. The Bible says ruling and reigning. So God is not the author of fear. And people who call themselves Christians, I'm not saying be a stoic or get a stiff upper lip, get a grip on yourself, man. I'm not saying that. We're human. We have emotions. We have the ebb and flow of faith. I get it. But what I'm telling you right now in this current situation, although I'm not sure of what's going on, I am sure of my faith, and I'm sure that my faith for me is the way. That doesn't mean I'm going to engage in foolishness and expose myself in a, a large group of people in any time or place like today. <laughs> it's meant to be humorous. But what it does mean is that we will do whatever we need to do, but not out of fear, not out of panic, and certainly not out of discrediting or disbelieving God's word. Now, I'm not sure what else to tell, especially my listening audience, except this. There are a lot of times, I'm, I look back and think to myself, certainly uncertain times, the death of loved ones, major crises in this country, terrorist attacks, things that you could definitely label as troublesome, and indeed even have or have had the capacity to have me questioning or have me doubting. But I've always come back to the book and I've always come back to the scriptures that give me the source of strength that I cannot get from anyone else. Even the people closest to me and their well-wishing and their well-meaning cannot give me the strength that I need from this book, cannot help me solve my problems except from this book and from God himself. Now, I don't, I don't know what else to say to my listening audience except this, like Ebola, like SARS, like the N1H1, this will pass. And if you think about it, it's kind of it's frightening to me that, as I said, historically, we've had global, global pandemic events. And I, I'm sure if I went behind the plague and things that are recorded pre plague, 
that broke out, but certainly the things they called the Black Death, uh, there have been cyclical events throughout history to wipe out mass parts of the population. This is a historical fact. It's not somebody making up information. This particular disease right now, and I'm going to repeat this for the sake of everyone who can hear me, has taken 50 lives, and most of those have been elderly people, or they've been in clusters where the disease has taken hold for people who already had sickness and secondary uh, conditions. Also, unlike the flu, we're not, we haven't been given the right information. We first were told elderly and young are at great risk, but we're now finding out the young people are, can, are just carriers, that typically they will not succumb to any part that's the latest from the CDC. They will not succumb to any part of this disease, but they will become carriers. So let me ask you something. What is the wisdom of making a rash decision to send your children home from school and to shut down a school if your children are carriers, but you yourself as an adult are still susceptible? This is why I said it's too, for me, it's too pre premature. I need some time during the week to first and foremost pray about this. Your health, your safety, and your well-being and not act in anything else but faith, not foolishness. So stay tuned, and I'm hoping that I've accomplished one thing today. As I said, I didn't come here to sermonize. I didn't come here to, I'm trying to help people get back if you are a father and you've kind of gotten off track in all of this. Today was designed to get you to look back at the scriptures again and say this is, this fear, panic, pandemonium, crisis, drive it all home is not how I conduct my life. And I, I'm pretty sure seeing you all here today, it's not how you conduct yours. So let's agree on one thing, that we will make it through, and we'll look back on this time and say, uncertainty, yes, but what? We made it through. Say it with me. We made it through. I haven't even put a year. I haven't even put a time. We just made it through, right? Okay. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch, listen, and learn 24 hours a day, simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.